Welcome, everybody. One Degree is Scandalous with the man over here, Cato Kalen. I'm Tom Zetter. We have a great guest. We're talking about Hollywood productions today, man. The writer strike has started, yeah. so we're going to go behind the scenes of some of your favorite movies, some of your favorite TV shows with a guy who's been busting his ass here in Hollywood, one of the most successful guys for what he does, and a, does, and I, a great dude. First time I've seen on IMDb, they have a table of contents just for his page. This is amazing. <laughs> At it the very like, top I, of it, it says, be patient. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> very long. It's like, oh my, what hasn't this person worked? And we're going to get there because uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, and you know what? When Cato and I get somebody in our hot seat, I don't tell them this till they sit down, but we have a way of getting the good stuff out of them. Right. They walk out of here, God, I should never have said that about that person. Holy I, crap. Yes, yeah, so be in big danger. He's going to go on strike on our show. <laughs> he won't say a thing. Hey, man, but it's good to be back. One degree is scandalous. God, it's good to see you, Cato. Hey, by the way, <laughs> if you haven't downloaded and subscribed to us on YouTube and everywhere else you get your audio channels, do it. Do it now. Do it often. Do it. Give us a five-star review. Do it. Um, we're cranking this into overdrive. We've got a lot of exciting things. I think Cato's going to be everywhere coming up in the next year. Yeah, I'm, I'll tell you, this is a great uh, segue. Um, I'm working on a show called Wrong Place, Wrong Time, and yes, we signed a deal. It was amazing, and Tom, of course, you're part of it. Uh, the call we had j yesterday was – when you know you're with the right people, you just know it, and they're go-getters, and so this show will be uh, – I think in 2023, Gosh, I'm airing, excited. Get, getting it on the air, and it's an incredible show. It's a, just by the title, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. It's a true crime show, and uh, I was pretty much – have you ever been involved in a, in a crime like that or ever seen anything? I know, but I'm hoping that crime for me does pay. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> exactly you, uh, yeah, I, they have the perfect guy, yeah, we'll Cato Kalen. No, above scale. We'll ask, but, we'll, we'll we'll ask we'll our see. guest what, what this means when the production oh, yeah. company said, you, but we're going to sell this show for you. It's going to happen. You were busy too because I think you took a private jet to Palm Springs, which I think is like a three-minute flight. <laughs> is that true? Why don't you just get on a crop duster? <laughs> you know what? Again. Here's how glamorous <laughs> my life is. I could have, and Shonda, of course, went. She dropped everything Stage in her coach, life. Stagecoach, right? Stagecoach. I said, I'll drive. I'll bring some supplies. I couldn't leave on Friday, so I left on Saturday. I drove up. had no problem with that. Yeah, they, they took a private plane to, to uh, Stagecoach, which was awesome. You couldn't pay me anything. There's no amount of money that would get me to go to Coachella. I'm just too old for it. I just, I'm not into that kind of thing, that scene, that crowd, yeah, that I music. Stagecoach, on the other hand, everybody is there just having a great time. It reminds me of going to Nashville. And stock tip, throw my headphones up just a little bit if you don't mind. It reminds me of going to Nashville. Everybody just yeah. wants to have fun there. You walk up and down, I think it's Broadway, the main street in Nashville that's got the the lights, the neon, like a mini I've Vegas. been there in uh, Wizard World when I was hosting the Comic Cons. I, that was my, one of my favorite cities. I, <laughs> it was just so much fun. And and a, a buddy of mine used to live in Toluca Lake. Uh, his name's Patrick Carney. I'm name dropped, but he's the, uh, you know, he started the group called the Black Keys. Um, and... He moved to Nashville, and then when I was there doing that, we all had dinner. At some, I mean, they're in the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, the uh, Black Keys. I think they not, are. Not yet. No, no, no. no I hey, think don't you, doubt I me. I think you're thinking of um, you're thinking of the Black other Crows. Uh, Black Crows. No, the Black Keys. No, no, no. Are, uh, hey, Dave. Very. If, if you stay awake for the, Black Keys are too Black new. Black Keys. They're in yeah. the the no, Rock no. and Roll Hall. Of, no, Black Keys are too new. They're very old. Black okay, Crows. I'm gonna bet you guys. No, I, I, this I, has no, nothing to do with the Black Crows. Okay, if I'm right and you're wrong, I'll take the bet. Twenty push-ups each. At the end of this podcast. Well, I know because uh, our guest, I, I, the first thing I said, uh, 20 push-ups will be nothing now because he's been working out on on YouTube. And, uh, but when just, you lose, it, it you're works. knocking out 40? I'll knock out 40 if oh, I yeah. lose. No and problem. And he's in shape too. So, I'm in yeah. good shape. Hey, a, by the way, let me say a little bit more about your show, our show. This oh, yeah, is so yeah, exciting. Please, please. Wrong place, wrong time. Can you think of a better concept that involves Cato Kalen? It's Perfect. He's going to be the host. We've got the best company behind us, the best production company, I think, in L.A., in the world probably, that can sell this type of thing. So your usual suspects of where you go to watch these types of shows, true crime, man. And the thing we love about them the most, they're in this for the long haul. They yeah. only want to get involved with shows that they see – Doing a hundred episodes, so talk. You know, they talk. Uh, their shows are uh, doing five to ten years. Yes. So like everybody it. hears this when you're involved with the show. Gary's just shaking his head at us, but you know, you do hear this. But you also can cut through the BS sometimes and tell yeah. who's legit. And you know, when you're dealing with people that actually can get things done, and that's right. how we feel, and we're really excited. Yeah, just a, t tons of phone calls of other great things that are happening, and uh, uh, Tom is involved, and of course, our show itself. There's probably going to be some big news coming up with yes. One Degree of Scandalous. I don't know if I can say it. You can say it because you've been dealing with these people, but I don't know what to be saying. Coming up. Coming up. Coming well, up. Give me in one more week, and then we'll have something and, really exciting to and, announce. And by the way, I don't know how you have time to go to Stagecoach when you're actually – you're writing uh, 100,000 – Pages, Word, 100,000 <laughs> words. Did finish this book. I've dropped hints about this book I've been working on for the last, since the, when since we December. When we talk about it? You know what? 
give me a couple more weeks because this thing's it's going to be attached to a really big news story. It has something to do with Varsity Blues, and it's gonna it's really going to be a big news story nationally because whatever you thought you knew about Varsity Blues, there's a there's another side to the story, and there's a scandal within the scandal, and it's it's perfect for this, this show. Is this the kind of book you have to read with a jock and a cup on? <laughs> Or no, I, is it just you might me? want to. Just I, I, not, so now I just, I just do they have cups anymore? My son's fourteen; they don't wear them anymore in baseball. I don't think. I don't think they do. Yeah, I don't think you do. I think you. I think they. But what the hell do to. I know? Let's change the yeah. subject. I think it's a new design though, because the cups that when I grew up, I'm older than you, but the cups were they could rub against your thighs and uh and i'm a little bigger than most guys so i actually wore the world cup but i'm kidding <laughs> very small i'm very small of course it's, he did. it's a dixie cup hey by the way hey I, gary quit laughing at that joke okay listen a little bit too much laughter on the dixie cup please enough about my penis do you want to know where i got my bracelet you didn't ask i i was going to ask you and it's got a design tube <laughs> i'm going to guess jelly <laughs> No. This is my. This is how I got into uh, to uh, a stagecoach from Nelly. 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 The performer. Actual tickets from Nelly. He performed on Saturday night. He was amazing. He, wait but, a minute. Nelly's a stagecoach. Yes. That's country. No, he he's he's good. And it, well, you some people they could just entertain. It just doesn't matter, right? I mean that talent yeah. getting on that stage. Some people can't. There's some people that I, can't. I saw one. I'm not going to mention any names, but I thought it was a make a wish deal. But it's going. Um, he seemed like an intern up there. Like who's that? I'm not going to mention any oh, names. Oh, of someone? a performer, but it wasn't up to what I thought. Is it a popular like, performer? I think is, is it country? Someone that's uh, yeah, someone's up and coming, up okay. and coming, but maybe just wasn't ready for prime and, time yet. But Nelly always is, always has been. You know what? I, I will go to our guest, but a real quick thing about stagecoach, Cartel, and all that. I decided in my life I never go to concerts anymore unless they I get the 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 backstage or somewhere where you have to worry about the the crowds and the. Um, that's why I don't go to a lot of concerts. Well, then you won't like no, stagecoach. Actually, though, actually, though, the a concert that was backstage and I got the tickets to the party after were the Black Keys when they played at the Forum. The Black so, Keys are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You're going to see we'll these two it. guys doing push-ups at the end of this show. Stick around do you, for that. I want, do you even know one Black Key song? No, I don't. But here, okay. I do know that they're in the Hall of Fame. Let me, and I'm doing 40. I will do 40 push-ups, no problem. By the way, I'm upping this bat, bet. If I'm right, you're doing them with your shirts off. Okay. 20 push-ups <laughs> each. The show got really gay. Okay, you're very confident. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's bring in our guest. What do you say, Kato? Yeah, I, I'm so excited. Oh, by the way, a belated happy birthday to your beautiful, oh, Shung- lovely, wonderful wife, Shang Yi. Shang Yi. I just showed uh, Gary B the uh, um, picture. Shang Yi's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Had an incredible time. And she, like Tom goes, so oh, I'm late. I should have gave her a gift. She's on uh, Chinese time. No one is, at, I will tell her the dinner's at six. It's three o'clock. Start getting ready. It's constantly late. Constant. Really? La- she's constantly late. It's like, don't worry about it. This is life is short. Just enjoy. I go, I know, but this is a little R E S P E C T for my friends. <laughs> Kato, you've turned into an American woman already. <laughs> okay, she's late. What else is new? All right, um, bring her in. By the way, sometimes yeah. so we got to get her on the show. We're both. She's actually in the car. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> windows Hi, are down. Windows, you ready? Windows are down. Let's let's bring in our guest. By the way, if you're a fan of the programs that come out of this great studio, Action Park Media, yeah. Ramble On, and of course, Victory, you've heard this man's voice. He's got an unbelievable story. He's been behind the scenes at a very high level in Hollywood on some of the biggest shoots, some of the biggest productions, biggest movies, TV shows ever. Let's bring him in. Gary B. Golden. Gary. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for you guys seat. are hilarious. There's a lot of good energy in this room. I, I did not know what I was getting into, and I'm <laughs> looking at the door. But uh, <laughs> Gary, now yeah. that you've revealed your identity, are you? am I nuts? Are the Black Keys not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? You are nuts. <laughs> they are 100% not. Maybe the Black Crows are. Okay, here you Talk amongst yourselves as I look this okay, up. Okay, I thought that. Are you nuts? That sounds like something a Thai woman might say to you. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> oh, my you, God. I put in nuts? black keys, and I put in the letters R-O, and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame came up right away. Hang on. Yeah. Okay, that, wait, There's not even worth a drum roll here. Yeah. I'm I, so I, confident that they're not. Yeah, they're too, they're they're too, too young. New. Yeah, they're too young, and they're, yeah. uh, they're, I, they will know, the be The kings of probably. Leon are even in it. Yeah. yeah. I'll get back to this. I, I, it won't take me long to, to write groups, up a fake Wikipedia that I like. You're thinking of the Black Crows, bro. No, I'm not. Yeah. I don't I'm know. I don't think the Black Crows, Crows are in there either, though. I don't, not yet. I don't they deserve so. to be. Yeah, they, they may be. Uh, okay. I anyway, mean, thank we'll you guys for Time having me. Thanks and for coming. congratulations on this new show, uh, Wrong Place, Wrong Time. What do you think? Could there be a better name that, like, you know, literally when you walk into a room and say you want to pitch something with an idea, I mean, that's one of those that you'd literally say... No brainer. And then with Kato Kalen attached to it, right? Yeah. I mean, boom. Like, and I, I mentioned the table of contents for IMDb page, and you know, I, honestly, you, you've you worked on every hot production, every production goes in years and years. Do you see this having legs? You're, you're, you're looking in the future? 
I see this having legs because you're a wonderful personality. You're incredibly engaging. The topic that you're talking about, people are interested in. Personally, I uh, have not worked on reality type mm -hmm. shows. Um, but it is certainly something I'm going to watch, bro. Wow. Great yeah. stuff. It'll be good. And you can go on and on and on. There's always going to be enough crime yep. that we can it, showcase can and I, people that were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we're going to talk about lots lots of current things. But I, was, I did. I looked at over your entire you. life career of what you did. And there's a film that you worked on. And that we'll go, go to Kurt and all that. But this is a film that still disturbs me today. And it's a sh film that I've had nightmares over because it was so it was shot. It was so real. I don't, you don't know what it is, but it's a crime. Um, I and know it's based it on a true story. And it's a film, like I said, I saw. And it disturbs me to this day called Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, uh, with uh, Michael Rooker. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what you involvement and had its true story of um, a serial killer who still we don't know uh, how many he, he had killed over maybe I think he bragged that it was 377 some incredible amount Henry Henry uh, Lewis I think that was Henry well, well whatever the I name can't, but, I can't remember his name but I, I, to put all the cards on the table yeah. I did work on Henry portrait of a serial killer part two mm. So uh, it was uh, the same director had given his blessing to tell the story to a partner of his and uh, a wonderful cast and crew came in and knocked that out. It was just as horrific. Not uh, the True well, story, though, right? Yeah, Everything was true. true that's, that's what's I don't true. know the backstory. I've heard it's, of the movie. It's a guy who would, uh, you know, murdered a lot of people, would dress up in, um, uh, you know, I'm your electrical guy, I'm your cable guy, and come in and torture and hurt people. Oh, my people. God. Just yeah, the most horrific I mean, way possible. Oh, yeah. I, I would literally come home um, every night covered in blood Jeez. Yeah, it, it from was, the work. Was, I mean, we were doing screwdrivers into the eyeballs oh and up the nose. Oh, he did everything. But they had... Tortures, and I, I, I have not worked what on something like that again. What a deranged, sick individual. But, the, the th and it's disturbing. See, in the first one now, but the, um, which you, I'm sure you saw was mm -hmm. he had a partner for a while before he killed the partner and, and the mm -hmm. wife, uh, and he killed his wife and murdered, but he, he videotaped a just going into a family's home and videotape killing the mother, father, and then the little boy comes home from school and kills him. Anyway, it's this it's most horrific. disturbing picture. Wow. It's characters based on uh, director uh, John McNaughton's characters, and uh, yeah, really chilling. And that was one of that movie was, and the part two was also filmed uh, very realistically. It was ugly looking. It was ugly to look at. And, yeah, I think uh, out of Texas too. It was. It wasn't out of Texas. I think. I don't remember. I, I, isn't it insane what you could get away with before technology? I mean, to a murder spree like that? Yeah. I mean, without the DNA, without cameras picking up, whatever. Here, here's one question related to that. When, when, it, when it's that dark of a subject matter and that despicable of a human being, does the set take on that mood and that vibe or – is it just a factory? Yeah, you're, it's, you're creating it's, something. It takes on that mood and that vibe. It's you know chilling. We in that movie we had uh, two teenagers strapped up against bar, uh, some uh, chain link fence, crying for their lives, and that was really intense. Oh. And uh, he p played threw a whole bunch of bullets into him. Um, one of the interesting characters that came out of that is the very famous and successful Oscar nominated winner, probably at this point, is Michael Shannon. Yeah, uh, he he's... was in Portrait of Serial Killer Part Two. It was one of his first roles, and uh, I got to know him then. And um, oh, I haven't great. seen him since then. Yeah. I, we had drinks in a bar before he moved to Chicago. I convinced him to move to uh, to L.A. just Dude, before I did. Chicago, did uh, a film there too. Chicago. Right? Yeah, um, Gary's background is so fascinating. Grew up in New York City. We're going to talk about that. Moved to Chicago and has been involved. I love Chicago as a movie city. It's just the backdrop with that skyline. It is perfect. Um, it's a big city. It's a it's a masculine city. It's just it's perfect for it. And it used to be very friendly for production shoots. I don't know how it is anymore, but it used to be a great Some place. Some of the to finest, go. finest, finest craftsmen, crew members, union members uh, in the filmmaking world live in Chicago. They're mm -hmm. they're very proud that they you can go to Chicago right. and film there and get everything you need, equipment to craft service to the best uh, grips and electrics and cameramen and. Sure. Anybody going to Chicago should be proud to work there. You're and, right. you know, people aren't jaded, right? I mean, it, mm -hmm. it's fun. It's it's a different. It's a different experience when a big Hollywood production comes Salt there. Salt of the earth, brother. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the people work there, but they've got their problems now. I'm just going to say that. They've got their problems now. Well, they've the main problem was their mayor. With, with the, yeah, oh, the, violence, the violence. Yeah. The violence. It's, I mean, we need Mayor tough. Daly back. 
<laughs> right? Come make some movies there again. Anyway, Gary, <laughs> we got to go through some of your just just your career so people know the types of shows. Because if you've got a, sh- a favorite show, either a movie or a TV show, chances are he's worked on it. I'm going to start like at the beginning part of his career. Uh, my one story we're going to talk about, which I love, is Gary worked on Fugitive. The Fugitive with Harrison Chicago. Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. Um, another one of those great Chicago movies. Uh, Primal Fear. <laughs> another Ed great... I thought that's the one you were going to mention that still disturbs you, that Edward yeah. Norton was in, because those were pretty graphic killing scenes, Richard too. Richard Gere. Richard yeah. Gere. Just an amazing cast all the way up and down on that one. Portrait... Uh, the Harry... Uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle, little anime... No, that was with the guy... Robert De Niro. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, um... And then it goes Entourage. Every episode of Entourage. I mean, you go way back with Kevin and Doug. Yeah, I did. Um, I, that's a long story, but I did not do the pilot of Entourage. I turned it down because I was busy directing commercials, and I didn't really want to take that career turn. Sure. But I'd met Doug when doing a movie called Kissing a Fool in Chicago. That was Doug's first movie, starring um, David Schwimmer and Jason, Jason Lee and yep. Millie Avital. And I had a great time with Doug. And then he had moved to L.A. And then I moved to L.A. Uh, maybe Doug was already in L.A. And uh, I bumped into Doug and he's like, I got this, you know, HBO wants to do this pilot, something called Entourage. Will you please do it with me? And at the, I'm an assistant director, first AD. We can talk about that. That was my bread and butter mm-hmm. throughout my career. And uh, I turned it down. I said, Doug, I'm directing commercials. I don't really want to do that. And then he finished the pilot. Bumped into me again. This is before major cell phones were everywhere. And I bumped into him again. He's like, I hate all assistant directors. Please come do. Um, please come do. Uh, the show. The, the show. Series. He's right. like, it's all right. It's seven episodes. I'll do it. Sat down for the first table read. And I was enamored with everybody in that room, the story, the energy. And I was like, this is it. And sometimes you just know in your heart, this is going to be the next uh, facet of your career. Wow. Very it's, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, House of Lies. I loved that show. Don and, Cheadle. Yeah, that was Kristen great. Dunn. I got hooked on that on the airplane. Phenomenal just watching show. that back and forth to Minneapolis. Uh, that was really Matthew good. Matthew Carnahan's a showrunner, that one of the most brilliant writers in Hollywood. NCIS Los Angeles. Shameless. Another big hit. Shameless. Willem H. Gacy, right? William H. Macy. Macy, Macy, Macy yeah. yep. Um, I got I got serious. Jerry, killers Jerry on Lund- my mind. Sorry. Larry, Larry Lundgren. <laughs> the Affair. <laughs> uh, the Affair, another uh, critically acclaimed one. And of course, Ramble On. Let's, uh, we're all Ramble have on, high hopes for that Masters one. of Sex, Weeds, mm-hmm. Ray Donovan. Mm-hmm. So let's start it. What Growing up as a Yankee fan in New York, what was your background with entertainment, with production? Were you making home movies? What what got you into this biz? I was not. I was uh, I was just a random kid uh, running around trying to figure out what li- what life was about, and then uh, I went away to a different. I, my parents switched me to a different school because I wasn't uh, excelling, as you would say. So I switched to a different school, and I immediately became enamored with theater and the world of theater. But what? Here's the question: it Was like what? Ma- what did I like about it? I love the feeling of being backstage. Being part of something that uh, there was a curtain in front of us and everyone backstage, we were a team, we're trying to figure it out. And I just love the cables, the smell, the curtains, and I just love being backstage. And that was really the uh, auspices for me finding a path. Well, the energy, the whole energy of yeah. uh, something live, what could go wrong, what could go right. That, that happened That's... in high school. And then uh, <clears throat> I went to college. I minored in um, theater, tried to be an actor. That's a, long, a whole other story. Did that give you a newfound respect for actors? A hundred percent. I actually did. Uh, I played Dromeo of Syracuse of, uh, from a Shakespeare play, Comedy of Errors. And I had a great time doing that. And I realized this is just really, really hard. So the longer story is when I graduated, my parents moved from New York to Chicago. And they're like, well, what are you going to do? I went to Ohio Wesleyan University in, uh, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, Delaware, Ohio. And uh, what are you going to do? And... Um, I told them I wanted to get in the entertainment business. They said, you're crazy. Like, you know, so I got a, I said, that's what I really want to do. I, I also dabbled in, uh, I had a girlfriend who was a, a, a singer songwriter and I was living in Newport, Rhode Island in that whole world out that's there fun. and was able to book her on a whole bunch of at music venues. And I was like, this is, this is the yeah. entertainment business. Yeah. I love doing this behind the scene music gigs. I thought maybe I'd get into that. Um, but I, um, I just uh, got my first job as a, um, a production assistant. So what happens is you just you decide that you want to be in the entertainment industry. What do you do? You read up on it. There's a couple books out there I could tell the kids to get called uh, Making it in Film and Getting into Film by Mel London. I literally read these books to learn the jargon. 
And uh, I started writing everybody in Chicago that had a production company at the A's, uh, the, the, the list from the you know companies that began with A down to Z. And by the time I got to the M's, a company with the C's called me up. <laughs> and my first commercial as a production assistant was um, painting Easter eggs, um, you know, for that like Ronco commercial. And uh, I was an hour and a half late. I was wore a tie and a blazer uh, to a production, which, and you have any idea, that's the wrong attire. So first of all, don't wear a tie and jacket to uh, a production, and don't be late. So two for two. I learned my lesson first thing. But the interesting thing was that um, the key PA, the smartest PA, the experienced PA there, was an incredibly successful person out there now, uh, Joey Soloway, who created uh, Transparent. Um, uh, really. Yeah, popular yeah. show, and uh, she was the key PA out there. So they didn't turn you around. Said, uh, "You're late. You got the suit nah, on. That's they, cool." They right? Needed me. So, yeah, so when, I got dirty and started building an IKEA table or something. When you when you met Doug Allen and you were, he said you couldn't do it. You're shooting commercials because the you're you're directing commercials. Mm -hmm. The the money for commercials, people don't. Realize, it's it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. It's like you do commercials, and most a lot of I I, I did a few commercials, but I uh, also became friends. My I did a film called Beach Fever, and the direct uh, the a cameraman was named Kinka Usher. I don't sure. know Kinka. Sure, House one of, of Usher. Famous. He, he, um, this is this is years commercial back. Directors. One of the most famous commercial directors, and I was like, worked with him in 1989 or something, and I never lost contact with him. And um, it was a beach movie up in Oxnard. He's, it took us to his dad's house up in Montecito. It was like. My God. But he ended up shooting from commercials Mystery Men with Ben Stiller. And then he didn't, didn't he do The Cell with uh, Jennifer Lopez? I, I, I believe think? so. Yeah. But you're, I, what I'm saying is that you are in that group. Yeah. So it's hard to get out of commercials because the money is amazing. Right. I was assistant directing commercials and I was starting to direct commercials. And then <clears throat> I, for me, the commercial life was positive in one way. I traveled all over the world. I learned how to be a filmmaker. I learned importantly about uh, covering the minutia of filmmaking instead of just shooting a wide shot and worrying about performance. You got to come in close for yeah. what you're selling and some of those elements. So I, and, and you get to learn how to use all the expensive equipment and all the inexpensive equipment. So it's a phenomenal uh, training ground. And, you know, trying to tell a story in 30 to 60 seconds right. is a challenge. Yeah. And some of those guys it, that do it well really do. We work on it for a week, take a little break. If you want, right, and now now it's fifteen seconds or whatever it is. It's whatever's on your phone. It's yeah. five seconds. I mean, look at there's huge directors that do commercials. Ridley Scott. I mean, oh yeah, you, these guys sure they roll still has out, a huge man. production company, uh -huh. RSA USA. Well, they yeah. do. They they uh, advertise. I'm sure they they want a big name director for their Super Bowl commercial, so they start sure. that in advance, probably a yeah. year in advance. Say, hey, we got this idea, and we in the get the publicity with that big name. But that was back in, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Commercial productions were uh, gigantic budgets. and uh, So it's and not now, anymore. I, I don't think it is like that. I haven't done commercials in a while, but I, I understand that the budgets are very competitive and very low and, you know. Well, think about it. Equipment has evolved so much too, right? Exactly. That you yeah. don't have to spend that kind of money. And someone who's really talented could probably come in and do it for less. So then you're in Chicago, you're, and that's a great advertising market. I mean, those are big-time agencies, mm -hmm. so I understand how you got the big commercials. And then how did it lead to movies? The Fugitive still holds up. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. I love yeah. that movie. Um, and Gary, you got to tell us about your main role. Wasn't it the fight scene on top of the skyscraper? Yeah, what you involved I, in that? On The Fugitive, I was the second assistant director in the second unit. And second units, for those that don't know out there, are usually the units that uh, the first unit says, you know, you're Harrison Ford and um, your main characters and they're shooting the story. But when there's a lot of stunts happening, a second unit director and a, a, literally another film crew will come in to shoot those stunts. Uh, and with, of course, the full pr approval of uh, Andrew Davis, who was the director. And um, so, yeah, so I was the second unit and we were in charge of shooting the um, rooftop uh, fight scene where they crash through uh, through the top uh, sun roof there. No, it's him and that right. other doctor going at it. Yeah. Hi, uh, hardcore, just man. passed away like five years. How Crab, fake does uh, that look when you're watching that in person? I mean, they were hitting each other with bars it, uh, and railings. and When you're at that level with such phenomenal stunt coordinators, stunt performers, it does not look fake. Huh. It, it looks oh, painful, yeah. and I do not want to fall that 12 feet down that hole, no matter how many... Um, um, pads you're landing on. Uh, those guys make it look great. And again, another select group of uh, amazing craftsmen. Yeah. Too, yeah bad, I, too bad Harrison Ford didn't have stuntmen when he flies planes. <laughs> he could yeah. use them then. <laughs> Crashing, yeah. And, and Andrew, Andrew Davis, who directed that, also uh, did a film. I think it might have been one of his first films with Steven Seagal, which made him a big hit out of Chicago, also. I think he must be from Chicago. If, yeah. And, um, and that was. Under uh, Siege. No, no, no. no. Uh, the first one that he did was actually the best 
Seagal film, and it was um, uh, I'll get the name in a second or, or Stock Tip Dave, the first one. It's it is it when I saw it, yeah. you knew at that time before people were talking about Steven Seagal in a, in a bad way. There, I said. This is going to be a mega well, I mean, star. Well, look, the back say, because of the the new kind of karate that he did. And well, you know the back the story with him, right? How he got into Hollywood. It's an amazing story. Yeah, Michael Ovitz. The, yeah. He was he was Michael Struck Ovitz's it. trainer. Michael Ovitz trained with him every single morning yeah. at like five thirty. They had a CAA, and so he thought, ah, hey, this guy's got something, and he put him into I, movies. That's a wow. that. that Oh, was that Seagal? No, I'm asking. No, yes, yes. That's, that's amazing. No, that's the I did true not know story. That. Oh, yeah. It's above above his book. the law, it was called. Above oh, the law. yeah, that sure. was that was his biggest above, and yeah, best yeah. probably, yeah. too. And, and because of the director. Yeah. Because he made he, – the villains were perfect. And yeah. The villains yeah. perfect. The, the other thing about um, – the fugitive is those Chicago cops seem so real. They were real. They were real. Okay, were they? Yeah. So those yeah. weren't like those guys actors. Man, they were good. They were real. Yeah. They were great. Uh, they were great to work with. That whole cast was great to work. It was great to be a part of. It was great to be. That was my first experience on a tremendously large production, big Hollywood film, and uh, everything about it was uh, was really fun. Yeah, that's big time. Which actor yeah. was an asshole? <laughs> um, well, they say Mr. Berenger was uh, a very tough. Tom Berenger. Yes. Yeah. Uh, was very tough to uh, no, not Tom Berenger. I'm so sorry. Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. Okay. Oh, yeah. So sorry. Now he yeah. really smacked me around. <laughs> uh, Tommy Lee Jones was, um, but I, I found him to be nothing but a consummate professional. Yeah, and, oh, yeah. Uh, and so really too. just there to do the job and work. And sure, you know, you hear a lot of things about uh, people being, you know, difficult or assholes, but most of the time they're just out there like you are to do a really good job for mm -hmm. the work. Get yeah. home it, at night. I, and I, I, I think we, they respect guys like you that are the same way that yeah. want to do the job. There might be some conflict when someone's mailing it in or somebody doesn't give a crap right that's on the on the crew and or if you have a big creative difference then it gets a little mm -hmm. bit different there but most times uh people are out there so happy to get to their point in their careers where they can be working consistently and uh making a living and uh really enjoying their craft god there's yeah. still some jerks though yeah there are. <laughs> we'll get to them well, yeah, I also think that if someone has a bad day, you can't judge someone for not saying hi to you that day. It's like, oh, exactly. someone just goes, oh, that guy's just such a dick. No, they, but they I think people that have been in the business a long time, you could tell yeah. the difference. But the other yeah. side of the coin is that they're in the you three of us, I mean, you will, but Cato will, but we don't have to get in front of the camera. And that's a b whole lot of uh, other anxiety that uh, I respect and um, and understand. Yeah, but you that's know what? I, I, cut, I don't cut them quite as much slack because they know what they signed up for. That's their job. I mean, everybody's yeah. got parts of their job that aren't perfect or glamorous or, or that other people don't have to deal with. You could still be cool, right? And and but this isn't about which yeah. actors. Although I could tell you a couple. No, I haven't. I have I, done that on past shows. <laughs> My Bill Murray story though is good. You know, it's just and when they are a total ass like that, you never forget it. Don't don't ruin Bill Murray. Oh, I'm sorry. Bill Murray is not <laughs> the 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 happy go lucky joke. Oh, sorry, I got two I, Bill Murray friends. The friends of Bill in here. Sorry, let's change the subject. <laughs> let's change the subject. Um, okay, so were you thinking I got to uh, get to Hollywood? I'll be. Uh, by the way, uh, real quick, when I'll be with Joel Murray, and I think Bill will probably be there at the uh, in May May twentieth of this year in Chicago. Doing a uh, a big golf tourney. So I love Joel. I've worked with him on Shameless, and I worked with him on a show called For Stars uh, last year called Heels, uh, about the wrestling uh, behind the scenes of a wrestling family. Uh, a really good show on Stars, I saw produced that. and directed mm -hmm. by uh, Michael Malley. Um, <clears throat> but Joe, Joe, I mean Joel, Joel yeah. Murray is a phenomenal human being. Yeah, and I do. I it's cannot say enough things, nice things. And about and, him. and it's uh, the sponsors are the Chicago Police and Fire Departments. Amazing. So and you were just talking about that. So I'll be around yeah. that whole thing. This is something that you should probably be involved yeah. with. Get me there. My parents still live in Chicago. I'm invited. Oh. Get me there. Summer in Chicago. Love no it. better summer city. Chicago. That's true. As good as it gets. I will. Fun time. For I'm from damn from, sure. What? I'm Milwaukee. Well, Milwaukee's. It's so Pretty beautiful. good. It's Almost so as good. It's so beautiful. But they have Summerfest there, right? Oh, Milwaukee. God, Gary B. <laughs> what is the B for? <laughs> Summerfest is real, right? That big music? It's not. It's Biatch. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Gary Biatch. Go, oh, man. That will not come out in this meeting. Okay, don't say it. Please. Next meeting. <laughs> All right, Brian, stop it. <laughs> Anyways, Bill. Okay, I'm telling you, Beatrice. Um, <laughs> um, so let me just, just give you guys just a reference of the career of yeah. what I do and what I've done just real quickly and so that this audience can understand. So I came up as like a real salt of the earth crew member, production member. I came up as a production assistant, working with uh, closely with the directors. I worked in locations, helping to find these locations. And then I worked closely with the in the directorial department and eventually became a first assistant director. And the first assistant director, for everyone that doesn't know out there, 
uh, is very much like this, the field general out there on a uh, on a shoot, responsible for scheduling the show, making sure all the elements from all the departments are there, and uh, essentially getting everything into the frame that the director wants, and just as importantly, keeping everything out, okay. and then working among a triumvirate of the director of photography, the director, and the DP uh, to try and make the best of the day that you have and get the most creative work out of everybody there and communicate to the crew. Mm-hmm. But I also ended up uh, being a producer and a director as my career went on. Okay, nice. so having said that and having scandal involved here and at your professional opinion, of uh, if you can say. Yeah. And I know you read on it uh, because you're in this business. What is your professional opinion of the uh, uh, disaster on Rust with Alec Baldwin? And what do you think? Because you're familiar with everybody that works on the set. You're yeah. familiar with the props. Uh, yeah. uh, anybody handling guns. What do you think went wrong? Uh, your opinion. My opinion is uh, that should never have happened. It's a tragedy for all of us. Now, when you think about the tra- the magnitude of the tragedy, you know there's th- you can't turn on a TV show without or a movie without seeing rapid gunfire all the time I- from since you were a kid. There's been two horrible accidents that I can name is the one with Brandon Lee Brandon in 1990 Lee. and this one with this uh, amazing DP that was her life was ended way too early. Mm-hmm. I can't think of anybody else. I'm not belittling the amount of times because these two tragedies are severe, but it's a very mm-hmm. rare occurrence. So let's just say that straight out. Uh, regarding bullets and ammo on set. I'm, I'm one of the people, at, whether I'm the director or the assistant director, I'm in charge of making sure that that gun is safe, meaning in charge I'm one of the legs that before it gets to the actor, uh, everyone checks it. And <clears throat> I know that there are a lot of actors when handed a weapon will look at the weapon and, and want to see inside the weapon and make sure it is secure and not and is in fact a cold gun. If an actor's cold handed gun, a, explain that. A, a not a live gun. bullet. A, not a live bullet. But uh, uh, but you th- see a cartridge in there, correct? Right, but then you take but, out. The, what you should do is you take out the cartridge. Uh, the cartridge is in there for one reason. To um, nothing's in it. Nothing's in it. It's got a little BB in it that makes a sound. That's it. Yeah. That you know it's fake, and there's no primer in it, meaning that it can't load. And there's a. Uh, it's dinged on the side, so you know it's a fake bullet in there. Right. Um, sometimes they keep uh, they, you will do quarter loads or half loads that have um, that have gunpowder in them, but they're just used for the sound, which now we can replicate. But other times they need yeah. that quarter load to pop the shell casing out, so you actually see the shell casing mm-hmm. come out, mm-hmm. and uh, that's what makes it look real. So uh, you listen. Apparently there were real bullets on set. I, I've, obviously there was. I've never heard of that in my entire life. How real bullets got on set is really that's the yeah. biggest question. The like biggest how could question. he even it up there? But yeah. because of the just the possibility that there could be a real bullet in there, that's why the train of security measures are taken so severely. Yeah. Meaning that the prop, the, the armorer looks first, then gives it to the prop master if they're not the same person, or maybe the armorer just takes it right to the assistant director. The assistant director would usually then say, hey, I am. there's a weapon on set, announce the entire crew. There's a weapon on set. It is a fake gun, meaning it's just rubber, or it's a non-gun, meaning it's also fake, or it's a real weapon, but it is. Uh, there's no loads in it. And who would like to check it? Me as an assistant director, I ask everybody on set who's looking at me, who wants to see it? Then I make sure who it's being pointed at right. gets to see it. Lastly, I give it to the person who's holding it. I don't, or the armor or the prop master does. If, if I'm handing it, the armor or the prop master is standing right next to me. Mm-hmm. It is their responsibility. I want to make sure that's very clear. So, right. So in, sh- in sh- uh, films like The Crow and, or any films where you see massive amounts of machine guns and everything going off and you see the bullets and, and that going, those are all blanks? Yes. I mean, and... Uh, blanks of quarter loads or... Um, and yeah. is there a direction of... A, is there a, a... Because sometimes in a film it seems like just r- random, everybody shoot, but is there... A focus of you shoot, you shoot, you shoot, and every it, it's and a, it's everything like that is completely choreographed with weapon. It's with it's weaponry. different because with Brandon Lee, it's like what well, what happened with Brandon wrong? Lee? From what I understand, and I will not be quoted on this, is that it was a fake bullet, but there was uh, and it was checked, but there was something in the barrel of the gun that came out with enough pressure uh, to 
be made. To what be are the odds damage. that all all everything could align? Right. But if somebody yeah. looked in the in the barrel there, maybe yeah. wouldn't have. But a- another but person that actually died, we forgot about that. Many I don't know if you even know who it is, but it's uh, John uh, Eric Hexum, a uh, long time ago on a, on a TV mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. Did that where he held the gun to his head, Oof. and he, he knew it was a blank, That's and, terrible. and uh, the blank itself killed him. You know, I'm surprised that yeah. that Alec Baldwin took as much blood. Now he was the EP, so I get it. You know, well, it's got to start. But but he's. I'm, listen, I'm going to give a, a shout out to uh, Ellen Barkin, who we worked with on um, Animal Kingdom. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of weapons on that show. Every single take that we did after she checked the weapon. Cut, okay, we reset everything. She wanted to see the gun again every single time because she knows that it's a dangerous thing. There are cast members out there that will take it into their own hands and should, as far as I'm concerned. You are holding a weapon... You know, if you're getting into a car and driving, I mean, there's a. I've had some really great arguments with people uh, in the business about this, and this is just my opinion, that whoever's holding that weapon is the last person in charge yeah. of that weapon should take a look or cur- but, cursory sure, look. Sure, but you yeah. said there's real guns on set. Why? First of all, why is there a real gun? If it's a real gun, why is the pin not pulled? Or why would there even be a real gun that could kill someone? The real reason that the, the real gun is on set <clears throat> for only use of the, those fake bullets, the quarter loads, uh, which fire the loud sound, mm-hmm. and and also eject the bullet. That's why you would have a real gun because you do need the pin to uh, hit the primer. You know, yeah. I, I look. I'm not trying to make excuses for Baldwin, but the armorer. I mean, that their sole responsibility is hundred percent, and that means shouldn't they check every bullet that comes in to the set? Look at it. Maybe, yeah. How do you so, even tell? Certain, though? How do you tell? Even it's if you so look at easy to no, tell no because powder. because the fake ones are so built so that you can take it out. There's a there's a niche in the bottom where the primer is, meaning there's no primer in there, and you shake it and you hear a fake BB in there rolling around, so you know this is fake. And that's the my experience. But, sure. Uh, you got a western. There's probably a lot of bullets. There's a lot of shooting scenes. I don't know how many, but it, I mean, it's it's a tedious job. I would imagine. they were shooting live bo- rounds uh, during some phases of their shoot and sh- doing target practice. Mm-hmm. Oh, it got mixed up or something. And that's what they're saying. That's something you know, got, it's just the, the but, whole case is weird. Isn't but even it? if it did get mixed up. That should have been checked on set, oh, and the fact that it wasn't is well, is shocking. Again, I don't know all the details, and, and it's a, it's an extreme tragedy for that assistant director, who I think uh, David I can't remember his name, but he, you know I think he admitted uh, admitted some guilt or uh, I don't know. Yeah, and then the, there's, there's also, two people got shot, right? Uh, uh, did, 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 the director yes, somebody else went did. through, so and, went through, went through. and hit the uh, director. And there's well. the whole issue of where he was pointing the gun too. I mean, that's kind of like you don't. Like, and he also says that he never somebody. pulled the trigger. We yeah. can talk about this forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, We're moving it's on, a but tragic is, thing, but people should uh, now more than ever. Guns are um, yeah. are, are checked. I just bring everybody. it up because that's no. It's you, a great question. Work on that. I mean, I just topic. worked on the, on the menu. Have you guys seen the movie The Menu? Yes, with, uh, Ray yes. Fiennes? Remember, there's a uh, a shot in there. I don't want to ruin the movie for some people, but yeah. that gun was checked. You know, every single take. Especially now, people are going to be hypersensitive, right? If you're holding that gun, man, you because don't want to be because he was holding it. Yeah, but yeah. there, but yeah. in that, that's isn't that all? Isn't that a D? What in effect? It, that was think? just that was pure effect. Yeah. But but you know, he is pulling the trigger, so the hammer does go back. So but that gun. Check. Yeah, and that gun hopefully was completely fake. You could still do that. We right? had two guns. We had a completely fake gun and then a real on gun. That the was just a, on the yeah, menu. On the menu. Yeah. You know, the bottom line is, in your role, it's all attention to detail, isn't it? And you're the first to blame, right? If something gets into that scene or the first one they're going to call, right? Is there ever a moment well, for you to I relax when I, you're working? I don't working? know if it's about the first to blame. It's first to communicate. To yeah, but that's what I meant. I didn't mean to blame. <laughs> but I, my point is, you're a very detail-oriented person. Um, but that's your job too, isn't it? I'm only detail oriented in my in my work. At home, right? I'm a mess. <laughs> but uh, my, yes, it's the details of every uh-huh. of every element. From you know, making sure the, you, when you're reading the scene, there's like you know the guy sitting at his computer with the, you know all his whatever. You you list everything so that the prop you and the prop master are on the same page. Yeah. Oh, my or, wife says I'm shooting blanks. But as far as I, we had to a little bit of That's the cheerfulness funny. there. Gary, you knew it was coming. <laughs> and I and I had no armor or checking my pants. <laughs> Should have, didn't have her. I said, can we get her over here? Right, Check my matter. pants, yeah. Where I, where's the AD? <laughs> Check my pants now. Well, you're going to have some writers that have Miss, time to, to sign up for armor. Right, yeah, the writing strike. 
Sorry. I'm oh, no, go ahead. Wait. That job as an assistant director, yes, is a lot of stress. Uh-huh. You're answering the questions of everybody on set, and you're keeping the, you have yeah. to watch out for the time. But also, I moved up to being a producer and also being an assistant director. But <clears throat> I mean, being a director, but the job of the assistant director, a good one, is known immediately, mm-hmm. I think, by uh, when a cast member walks on set or a crew comes on set, they know that they're going to be in good hands or, or we're in a little bit of a trouble today. Yeah. Yeah. The, Kato, there's some great episodes that you were on Victory. Just mm-hmm. talking about the business and, and and your particular experiences with Entourage, mm-hmm. just all the episodes that you were involved in. Mm-hmm. Um, it, when you're involved in picking locations, I think that is so cool, right? When you when if you have a role in that, and then you see it come together, because making a movie is still magic. Do you still get that excitement that maybe you did earlier in your career, where you watch this thing being put together? A hundred percent. I mean, well, while well, working, let's so let's take the menu for example. Um, we're picking like where they're going to get on the boat at the beginning of the scene, you know, and you have, now you have to cut, you have to make sure you have the right boat. You have to make sure it's looking in the right direction for your son of when you're going to be there. And also in, we shot in Savannah and you have to be very aware of the tide and the tides coming up or down. And if you're shooting at like uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, but then at four o'clock, the, the dock is at a completely different place that it was. You have to be aware of that. But yes, the enthusiasm of putting it together and saying, wow, now I've read the script 10 times and now I see this dock where they're getting on the boat. It really does work. And also, you know, if you've been doing it long enough, this dock isn't going to work. Um, and you just know why. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is the uh, scene, I saw the film, so is the, is the uh, ending shot on the boat the same? Is that the same day almost as the beginning shots? Did you guys use that location uh, the uh, where everybody's getting on a boat and then the ending of the film is sort of the people on that boat? Is that? No, it's two of, different spots. Two different spots. So, yeah. you, you, okay, two different shots, uh, setups well, and days and everything. Yeah, I don't know if you're remembering exactly, but when they first get on the boat and then get off the boat to the main island. Right. Then at the very end of the movie, she They're, just, uh, one person gets on the boat. On the boat, the woman. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a different but, boat. Oh, see? Yeah. Attention to detail. Coast Guard boat. Oh, what's in the SS Minnow? Uh, no. Um, what do they say? Warning. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie yet, don't listen to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do Spoil- see the menu. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Yeah. It's I so agree. funny. Gary was involved with Doug Ellen in the movie. He was talking about kissing a fool. And Schwimmer was in that. Schwimmer's a great actor. He was so good in that. Um, but the thing that I remember about that movie, I was so excited to see it. You guys did such a great job on a limited budget. I've heard Doug talk about the budget. What was it, $10 million Or less than that? Three. $3 million. Wow. And you made it seem big time. But the reason I love that movie, the whole plot was about a Chicago sports anchor. And it was the exact time I was there as a Chicago sports anchor. And I thought you guys nailed it. He, Schwimmer was an re- anchor for WGN. And I was at NBC at the time. You should have been a consultant. But it was so funny because th- the places that he went to buy his clothes, Bigsby and Carruthers, that's where you would go. Um, the restaurants, the, the clubs, it was all exactly how Chicago was at that time. And just seeing Schwimmer's interaction with Sammy Sosa it's kind of how it was. You were kind of chummy with the athletes and the players back then. You guys nailed it. I mean, that was really good. Yeah, that's, you know, Doug, well, I think that's Doug Allen's second movie, mm-hmm. and uh, he crushed it. It was really, that's where Doug and I first met, uh, and it was really fun. Oh, that work. was your first meeting ever? Yeah. On Kissing a Fool? Yeah. That's why he asked him to come back and do Entourage, good. right? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a great story to have yeah. that. It's all relationships, by the way. It is. All you know, a lot of people say about the, the film industry, do they hire the best person? It's like, who are you going to be okay to stand next to for 12 hours a day? For and, multiple days. And right. 12 hours is a uh, light amount of time. And it's kind of like Doug Ellen, also the book of Clint Eastwood. You're always the same people. Always the same crew. Always the same, right. a lot of the same actors. and all. You get, a, just, you get a shorthand and you get a, a feeling of trust. And, yeah, and, trust. Um, I mean, it's a secret for life, really. If you just bust your ass and you're accountable, I mean, you can like name your future. Right? If you make good decisions and just try to stay away from the craziness. That's why I won't go to Coachella, by the way. Show up early. <laughs> yeah, show, show up early. early. And don't Learn that t- after a first commercial shoot. Don't wear a tie and you? don't be late. <laughs> <laughs> Throw those tweed jackets out. <laughs> show up early. <laughs> show up early and do your job. Don't I, talk so much. What was your thoughts? Listen. Did you did you think Entourage was going to be this cultural hit, this this thing that just, you know, even today? How, people long for that time, I think. They miss that type of content where you actually feel good watching a show as opposed to now you're like, okay, we get it. You're preaching to us. We're a little tired of this. I remember my wife and I watching um, – Sex in the City, a bunch, and saying, God, wouldn't it be great to work on a show like that that's just so culturally um, acceptable and enjoyable and relevant? And I was like, God, yeah, I really want to work on a show like that. And then 
entourage came into Little our, did you know. came to came into our laps and I didn't know it'd be that amazing that you know but I knew we were going to have a really good time making that show. Yeah. Yeah, and you guys have all stuck together. Now you've got Ramble On, which is a really exciting project. I mean, Doug Ellen's new show Ramble On, Charlie Sheen's in it, Connolly's in it, uh, Dylan's in it, Martin Sheen, mm -hmm. Jamie Lynn Siegler, and the crazy thing Cato is you've John seen John McGinley. The John McGinley, you've seen the trailer. It takes place in Action Park Media. Mm -hmm. which, which I mean, which is just so incredible. Yeah, I've only seen the trailer, so I can't say. But I just saw the trailer, and when I saw the trailer, uh, and whoever cut it was it's a, it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful cut, and it's like looks like a feature film. Doesn't yeah, it? and it's, the it's, pilot yeah, is so go, good you too. You go, I get it. So I think people will. will it's the get fastest it. twenty three minutes you could spend in your life and watching the, that. And pilot. the world is yeah. becoming podcast, and who doesn't want to know more about it? So yeah. I. I so just I'm so everyone, yeah, we can Yeah, I don't want to tell, talk more about Ramblin. I don't yeah. know what people know or not. You yeah. know what? Yeah. I probably not just, that much. I mean, it's yeah. out there. I mean, if you read, if you've seen the internet, I mean, like Outkick just did a big piece on it. Outkick is a very popular sports site. Fox owns it. Outkick, yeah. Clay Travis's mm -hmm. site. Mm -hmm. They just did a big thing on it, and you see it. You know, you know, there'll be a story in Variety or Deadline or something, and then other people will pick it up. But you want to talk about it a little bit because it's gonna, it's gonna hopefully. It'll be something we all see here. Right. Ramble On is uh, in the process of uh, getting sold and, and getting a, a place to land, like a studio and so, such and such. Um, it was a, it's a wonderful project. And um, I, without Doug here, I don't feel very uh, comfortable no problem. talking about the oh, yeah. story. Yeah, okay. We won't have to do that. Uh, but I don't know if he wants me to give anything. Hey, away. let me just oh, say no, this. I don't want to talk, if no, you don't like Entourage, you you're going to love this show. Exactly. And, it's, and it's, it's all about, to it. It has the same elements of Entourage, meaning friendship and watching out for each other. and um, A lot of the same characters. And playing themselves, by the way. It's comedy with consequence. Yeah, yeah. You know, Gary, I was thinking about this, too. As comedy <laughs> Wait, I got to take a minute for there. <laughs> Oh, okay, I like that. I, it's, I, it's speaking of, I can speak about entourage, can I? Yeah. All right. There's a disclaimer in front of asking Gary B. Uh, no, but Gary, for uh, <laughs> when when uh, entourage was, who approached entourage about making a feature? Because that's a big process. Because the budget goes, <laughs> it climbs on that. Was that HBO well, that, saying? I mean, that was it, that happened starting like season five. They were talking about. Uh, I remember uh, Wayne Carmona, who was our uh, line producer on that, was like, "Wouldn't it be great to string two of these episodes in a row and send them over to the Grove Movie Theater and people come in there and watch it?" So that was the first bit, and then <clears throat> Doug knew when the. Um, when it was time to end the show, I think, and so did HBO. But everybody, it just was in the zeitgeist that this has, there has to be a movie here. And uh, I think the movie is really good. If you haven't seen the show, I don't think you need to see them. How about the opening credits alone? They're great. Yeah. You know, all the Hollywood sites and L.A. sites. With Doug, with oh, the Doug opening credits of the, of, the, of the actual show. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's all good. But, but, but with the film, I... I don't know the timeline. the The show had ended, and it, it was showed, wasn't it two years later. It was no, two four. years later. No, it was four. The show okay. ended in twenty eleven. No, no, I meant, I meant for the film. When yeah. the show ended, how lo how much yeah, longer? Four before years. the film. Yeah, the it, show ended in twenty eleven, and the movie came out in twenty fifteen. Yeah, we were shooting you. in twenty fourteen, and well, that's amazing yeah. that it still had the, the legs of people going. Okay, we're going to yeah. see this four years later. Yeah, it was so much fun. To yeah. Work on that. yeah. What was your role? Like, did it vary a lot for episode to episode? Uh, no, I was assistant director on that, and um, I was a producer on it as well. And um, I had a great relationship with the showrunner and the cast, and um, and, H and with HBO. And uh, I could my role because I was a producer and an assistant director, and I got scripts from Doug. I and and working with uh, the other uh, executive producer Steve Levinson, I was able to suggest locations to them. I was able to suggest. Um, cast members, mm -hmm. I was able to just be uh, intricately involved in it and really felt that sure. was. Hitch How, go ahead. Okay, Hitchcock put himself in uh, all his films. Are you in an episode of Entourage? Are you seeing? I think I'm, I'm in one episode of Entourage where we're outside of uh, Drama's Door, uh, outside of this, the set, the fake TV show called Five Towns, and I'm outside banging on Drama's Door for him to come out. I remember that, but wasn't he in there <laughs> <laughs> relieving his tension or something? I think was so. Was that the episode or Smoking Pot or something? I remember I, that I one. I don't remember, and he was still mic'd up and everyone could hear him outside. Okay, classic. I'm going to look, look for you. I'm going to find yeah. you on that one. Yeah. That's great. Um, how about some of the behind the scenes things? I, because if you think about it, think about this. What, 90 some episodes? That's like 30 movies. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Did the workload get Hard. easier as the show got um, maybe the characters like? Well, after season three, you sort of, you get like uh, Cato just said earlier, you get your people, you get your, uh, every, you know, 
you weed out who who wants to be there and who doesn't want to be there. So it was a pleasure coming in every day. I was going to say, it wasn't work to you. It was fun. It was work. I mean, let's... But when it's... You enjoy what you're doing. You enjoy... I For me, it's like, do I enjoy the people that are around? Our hair yeah. and makeup people are amazing. Our wardrobe people are amazing. Olivia yeah. and um, Raisa Patton, just amazing people. Um, we loved work, love working with them. So, yeah. but yes, it was work. Why did it get easier? Is because season one and two, I think we only were like five days an episode, meaning we had five days to shoot an episode. I think by the time we got to season seven and eight, we were be able to have seven and eight days to shoot. But because Doug is such a prolific writer, the amount of locations that we would have and the amount of extras, we were doing two, three company moves a day. Um, and it got harder in one way because we were recognizable wherever we got, wherever we went. I mean, Vince, a Adrian Ganey looked like a movie star, and when the boys were walking to um, scenes in Beverly Hills, the paparazzi would come out, 30 or 40 of them, taking pictures, and I had to include them into the shot and be like, okay, guys, you can't call him Adrian, call him Vince, and call Kevin Dillon drama, and then you can, you know, right. be a part, and we'll put you in. Okay, that's cool. That's something you had to deal with that you're not really yeah. expecting. Yeah. yeah. But that's the way to do it, to weave it in there. They probably I mean, appreciate it, it too. They were, they were great. Time. And how true is it that this is based on Mark Wahlberg's life? Is it is that the whole um, premise? He says it's loosely based on him, and I think Mark was a big part of, uh, obviously, a big part of putting this. In, and and I know one of the best stories is that Mark, uh, and he just he just talked about it the other day, uh, took the boys on a, on a private jet to Vegas. And uh, just to get them to bond and see what it's like to be an actual celebrity. Just to see what that lifestyle is oh, like. Oh, just right? recently. No, he no, recently no, he was, commented on that. He was talking about how right before the show started, he took the actors, like Connolly and, and Jerry and, and, and Adrian, <laughs> to Vegas so they could actually see what the interaction is with the public and how yeah. crazy it is. Because I see. But that was probably a really helpful uh, little. And just uh, so that they can bond and feel yeah, like completely you know, bonding. They can do yeah. The nice field trip, yeah. right? Yeah. Go to Vegas. And, and Wahlberg still probably has that connection with most of those people because I, I follow. And all the stuff he's got the tequila, uh, uh, he's got his uh, F forty five uh, health clubs. The guy uh, municipal uh, municipal clothing line. Yeah, it's I, I don't nothing negative to it. say about no, that. no no. Hey, I'll tell you this hard about Mark Man. No, no one works hard. harder. No, he Literally gets behind thirty it. in the mornings great working out. Like if he's behind a product, he's out there pushing it. Like yeah. his tequila yeah. right now, Fletcher Azul. I know all the people that are involved with that thing. I mean, he personally is going on appearances. Yeah, he's he, showing every, up. Every he's day. celebrity bartending. He made a great appearance in the movie too. Came right out, helped us out at Warner Brothers. Yeah. Did a funny little scene there. Okay, so for somebody who just respects the business so much, loves it, and has seen it from every different angle, what is it like when you see the script and then you're you're working on the technical aspects of it with the director and your crew, and then you see the actors, maybe even see some auditions and whatever's involved in this, and then maybe you see some of the dailies, but then when you go to that theater or you watch it on TV and you see it all come together... Are you blown away, or did you already have that in, that vision in your mind during the process? I definitely already had that vision in the process. For me, it's <clears throat> excuse me the respect that I end up for the uh, editors, which they put it because a movie or a script is done in three parts. So you get the script, then you get the shooting, and then the editor. <clears throat> so then, when you get to see the final cut, you realize uh, and you have questions of why uh, wasn't that scene included, or mm -hmm. um, they didn't use that other shot. That's usually my first questions. But uh, most of the time, you're, um, you know, the director and the editor work so hard uh, and editing that. So I get what is your if your question is, am I so surprised? It's it's a real sense of accomplishment for us on on, on Entourage. At least it was uh, amazing to see anything coming on the channel at nine o'clock on a on a Sunday night uh, because we were so stressed out shooting those episodes that I was amazed that it wasn't just an hour of uh, a half hour. Okay, of so black give screen. me give me one like uh, like just example like how close you pushed it. With the shooting up until the airtime. I mean, you know, there were a couple weeks ahead, but I mean, we had an episode, season four, episode one, Welcome to the Jungle, which is a phenomenal episode of Entourage. You got to check it out. It's basically uh, shooting uh, the, the shooting of Medellin, uh, where it's a mini uh, documentary. As it, it was as a documentary, but we were also shooting elements of the movie, and we were also shooting elements of the documentary and just the regular Entourage stuff. So you had three total elements there. The night before, we're about to shoot. Uh, Jerry Ferrara sadly calls me and says uh, a family member passed away and he can't come for the first three days of this shoot. And we had walked through – we knew we had such a massive episode. We, I, I was up the entire night. 
uh, rescheduling that show to shoot out to make sure I didn't have Jerry in the first three days. Mm-hmm. And that was massive amounts of Well, uh, think about challenge. it. That that affects everybody, everybody. right? It's sh- the shooting schedule that yeah. you thought you had. You had to move scenes, move location. And Where'd you shoot that, by the way, to make it look like the jungle? Uh, well, we shot at the Fantasy Island, um, you know, the Huntington Gardens, I think. And we also shot at, uh, at uh, where they shot um, the Three Amigos. So you weren't heading off yes. to Thailand or anything? There was a- no, but Entourage did take us to, we shot, um, <clears throat> we shot Hawaii. Mm-hmm. But when we went to Hawaii, we pretended it was Mexico. Thanks a lot. I don't know why. We shot in New York City, and we shot in uh, Cannes, France. Yeah, and Vegas. And Vegas. And Sundance. And Sundance. Yeah. You know, I, being the business, Tom, I didn't tell you this. We should do a quick, uh, Gary's busy man, but we'll do a quick, I'll say a word, and it's a speed round, and he has to describe, tell us in three words or less what it means. For example, I'll say a word, you tell us what it means. Oh, no. Rap. End of the day. Everyone goes home. Key grip. Technical lighting technician. Craft service. <laughs> Could be good. Extras. <laughs> Groupies. I don't know. Action. <laughs> Let's Cut. go. Cut. <laughs> Make it I just came up with that. Bonus. I just said, well, okay, these are just showbiz Blockbuster. Term. Oh, hit show. Ours. One degree of scandalous. Gary. Uh, hey, any show Goldman. that you, you would love, like you watch it now, you go, I'd love to get myself on that set. Anything that you... I that love you have shows done. that uh, take me out of um, how I feel like I'm watching filmmaking happen. Uh, that's why I love to watch like The Mandalorian. Like I don't know, there's so I don't know what they're doing. I know some wonderful people working on that show. I think they do a phenomenal job. I, you know, you're not in an office, you're not in real life. Uh, I last year I shot um, a show called uh, Manhunt which is a search for John Wilkes Booth coming out on Apple. Amazing show. And I never did a period piece before. So shows that take you out of just like real life and and being able to work with all the horses and the Civil War people. And um, it it was just really incredible. So those kind of shows that are based uh, not in reality, our modern day reality of cell phones and traffic. I just love, I love it all. I love the stories. I love everything. I mean, you know, Wild or uh, Animal Kingdom. That takes place in San Diego. If you're watching it, you think it's San Diego, but where are you shooting that? In the valley part no, of it? We, we would go to uh, Oceanside, which is uh, just north of San Diego, and shoot the exteriors there. John Wells is one of the most brilliant people in Hollywood, uh, West Wing and Shameless and Animal Kingdom and um, and more. Uh, on the Warner Brothers back lot, uh, we built an entire home. He built the home. Uh, to shoot in, and he built a pool there as well. So uh, that was all shot in the back lot of Warner Brothers. Showrunner. Showrunner. Um, writer slash producer. Okay. Kind of the boss, I, right? I, I, I'll, every so often, I just throw one in there for you. Thanks. Yeah. I'm ready to go. I, uh, you've got this down. You know what? Can I think, of corn. I, anything I, else? I, we've covered a lot. I mean, I, I, did you have fun, I hope? Here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I had a great show. time. I, I mean, I, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I had a great time. I think that, you know, another element I would have touched on is uh, shooting out of the country is really, really an interesting Can thing. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. What's it like when you shoot out of the country? Like when you leave the United States and then you have to go to a foreign land and shoot a movie? It's intense. I've shot in Marrakesh. I've shot in um, um, Thailand um, and all over Europe. But uh, one of the most exciting places to shoot was that on um, on um, House of Lies, which starred Don Cheadle and Kristen Bell and Ben Schwartz. Uh, and um, we went to uh, Cuba, and we were the first American company to come there and shoot scripted TV. And that was a really amazing experience. And uh, I do. So it's the final episode of House of Lies. Do check it out. Uh, we'll do. Really, amazing. and that's ambitious. Let's go to Cuba. Yeah. I do that. And also, a, a friend of mine is in the business. Also said uh, it's, it's also very chancy going to certain countries because uh, many times the equipment was just stolen, and there's nothing you can do. And this happened quite a few times. Yeah. That all, all millions of dollars of equipment, and there's no one you can go to. Hey, it's gone. They don't care. Yeah. I, I shot a uh, a gigantic commercial uh, in. Um, Barcelona, and we finished a day early, and we're sitting on the back of the trucks with the producer and the cameraman, and the cameraman puts this backpack on the back of him, and a motorcycle comes racing by. I'm like, that motorcycle's coming really fast. Comes by so fast, grabs the cameraman's backpack, drives off, and meanwhile, inside the backpack were the cards, the digital cards, oh! everything we shot. So the next day, we had to reshoot everything we did over a two and a half day period. Oh, yeah. could you it's imagine? It's gone. Yeah, it's never Nothing easy, folks. About, it's no, never it's easy. Not. It's there. not nearly as easy as that finished product looks. I mean, 
mean, the magic that's involved in putting this together, mm-hmm. it's unbelievable. So kudos to you for every project you've been on, Gary. Some great stuff, man. Turn on the TV. You can probably catch something that you've been on almost every night. Hopefully you'll see uh, you'll see Ramble on soon enough. Hey, soon man, enough. we're rooting for you. That Let's thing just, is going to be a huge hit, and it, I'm not just saying that. It is. It'll be great. It, we need it so bad. We need content I, I've like been that. flying Delta a lot, and I watched the, the menu twice, so now I'm going to really look for your name. It's fun. And let's uh, – I don't want to use the word pray lightly, but let's hope this uh, writer strike uh, gets pushed yeah, through. Yeah, what does this mean for the average content consumer, somebody that likes to you know watch shows on their streaming networks? What does well, it mean? as I understand it, all these streams – Streamers have enough content for about six months to a year that that they've stocked up. So if you're watching at home, you're going to be okay. I do understand that uh, late night talk show hosts will go dark. They did already, yeah. They did, so they won't be working. But your regular Netflix and Amazons, maybe you'll be have a couple things that are not at wrap, coming out as fast as usual, but they still have new product. Yeah, it's going to be sticky because it, it's all down to finances, and and I'm sure the writers want to know. You know, what are these streamers making? Like, what are the numbers? What does this look like? Sure. And it's pretty much a mystery. I don't think the writers are uh, striking because uh, they just want more money. They feel like they're being really uh, not respected and uh, not delivered enough finances for the how hard they work. They are the they are the heart and soul of our industry, creating out of their little desks and their computers, coming up with incredible content. Yeah. But what people, a lot of people don't understand, if, just give me another second here, no, is that if the writers aren't working, that means the entire crew and basically a regular TV show has, let's go, just go with 100 people. So 100 people aren't working when that show gets canceled. So out of those 100 people, plus all those 100 people um, are on their way to work grabbing lunches and there's craters and there's uh, the prop master has to call six people to find one prop. The wardrobe people has to call six clothiers to, to get something. So now those prop people in the... It just, it's just a... Constant flow of um, people not being able to work. There's a lot of um, tangents. To There's going to be some so some stressing fun. out here in the next couple of weeks. Probably not right away, but right. a week or two, and things that people are going to really feel well, it. It's been really slowed down for the last couple of months yeah. anyway right. in preparation for this. So uh, let's just get back to work, everybody. Uh, okay, I, I like that. Sounds like wrong place, wrong time is perfect timing. Right? Don't have to have wrong a place, wrong high time. paid writer on that one. I mean, All right, great stuff, Gary. Thanks for uh, you know peeling back the curtain here and on how shows are getting made. And anytime, you that guys was got fun. great energy here, and uh, I'll be on the show anytime. Thank All you right. guys so Love much. Uh, and can I just say one thing? Yeah. Um, if you want to reach out to me at at Mr. Gary B. Goldman on Instagram, I'll answer your behind the scenes questions for fun. Okay, okay one cool. time. That's Mr. Gary. Uh, Mr. B. Gary Goldman. G A R Y B is in boy Goldman. G O L D M A N. Hit for him up. Hit him up with a question. I'm going to do that right Look at sure. his IMDb page, too, and you'll see all, everything he's done. I'm going to write and say, what is the B for? Gosh, you know what? We're out of time. <laughs> oh, I'll check on the black keys for next week. I'll get back to you on that, okay? I'll get back to you. No I'll do push-ups. my 40 push-ups if I have mm. to. What the hell was I thinking? I love. Uh, Cato. Thank you, Gary. Have a good week. Good Thanks seeing a lot. you. Yes. Hey, uh, we have a big show coming up next week, too. A few of them, Boom, boom, boom. We've got a guest that's going to make this very, very interesting. Our next guest. We're taping. Don't look Wait, at me. Should I, should I say it? Yes, uh, say it. Tease it. Rachel? Rachel Ucatel is yes. going to join us on our next episode. Yeah. All Rachel, right. So Rachel's fantastic. Just did her show, and uh, she texted me and just said, our show was the top show for her. Yeah, so that's fantastic. Go find Rachel Ucatel's episode with Cato. It's a, it's really good. Yep. Um, and then she's going to be joining ours, so it's going to be fun. Nothing held back on that one. We're going to... We're going to have and, a great oh, conversation. she's got great stories, and she is really good at what she does. Yeah, and we love great. Rachel, and uh, and it, it's for her to be able to tell her whole story. Once you get to know her, it, it a lot of things just make sense. Okay, for Kato Kalen. That was a golf joke. For Gary B. Goldman. Thanks again, Gary. I'm Tom Zenner. One Degree of Scandalous. Download and subscribe. We'll see you next week. Bye.